you what I'm going to focus on in this talk is that this sense of deja vu that really came to me and I'm sure to many people when we saw this horrific earthquake disaster in Turkey back in February. Obviously a disaster that the areas affected will be spend decades trying to recover from. Um, let's just remind ourselves of those events. Uh, so February the 6th, two earthquakes. Uh, the first earthquake, the larger of the two, occurred about 4.15 in the morning when unfortunately a lot of people obviously were in buildings, in bed. Uh, hence, the, sort of the death toll linked to the earthquake, or, or one of the reasons. And the second earthquake occurred uh, slightly later in the day, uh, about 1.25 in the morning, slightly smaller earthquake. And they impacted particularly, as you know, on southeast Turkey, northern Syria. Those are the two earthquakes I'm going to be talking about, February the 6th. And I thought I'd start off by just saying or reminding you of a few things a little bit about earthquakes and how we characterize earthquakes, just so some of the terminology is hopefully clear. When it comes to describing earthquakes, we use two main sort of aspects of the earthquake. Uh, the first is the size, the physical size of the earthquake. Uh, that, uh, the measure that's often used and quoted in the papers is the, is the magnitude scale. That gives us a sense of the size of the earthquake, how much energy is being released. And the second parameter is the depth, the depth at which the earthquake originates. Um, and I'm going to start off talking about the depth, uh, B. Essentially, the depth is the distance between the focus of the earthquake, where the earthquake actually originates, and the Earth's surface. And the point on the Earth's surface closest to the focus is what we call the epicenter. So the epicenter isn't actually where the earthquake originates. It's a point on the Earth's surface closest to the focus. And earthquakes can be a range of focal depths, right down to about 700 kilometers. The shallower events have, have depths down to about 50 kilometers, 50 to 300 kilometers are the intermediate depth earthquakes, and then the deeper earthquakes go down to about 700 kilometers. And both our earthquakes in Turkey were shallow earthquakes. I'll say a little bit more about that later on. Let's now look at size, the size of the earthquake. And the scale that you'll all be aware of is the Richter scale, the Richter magnitude scale. Apologies. When I was producing this slide the other day, I actually cut the labels off the axes. So I'll explain to you. What you've got on the horizontal axis, the x-axis there, is the magnitude scale, the Richter magnitude scale, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right up to 9. The biggest earthquakes we get anywhere on the planet are 8.9 to 9 on the Richter scale. We don't get anything bigger than that. So you've got the Richter scale on the bottom axis, and then the vertical axis is a measure of energy, the amount of energy released. And then you've got a picture of Richter himself, uh, the guy who actually gives us uh, the scale. And the important thing to realize about the Richter scale, and this is something that a lot of people don't appreciate, is it's not a, it's not a linear scale. It's a logarithmic scale. So there's an exponential increase in the amount of energy released as you go through the units of the Richter scale. And what you've got then here is the descriptors that are used to describe these different levels on the Richter scale. But when you get to the top end of the scale up here, there are massive differences in the amount of energy released in these earthquakes between 7, 8, and 9. So I'll give you some sense of it there. Uh, magnitude 9 is 15 times stronger than 8.2, and a thousand times, that an earthquake up there is a thousand times stronger than an earthquake that's at magnitude 7. In terms of earthquakes in this country, the, 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 the highest magnitudes we get tend to be sort of down here, the biggest earthquakes that we get in this country. So we're not in that sort of category. Uh, so in essence, when you go up the Richter scale, there's a 32-fold increase in energy with each unit. And uh, I, I used to use this sort of uh, analogy for students, trying to get help them to visualize this. If you imagine for one minute that the amount of energy released in a magnitude 5 earthquake is equivalent to you breaking a strand of spaghetti. Now, obviously, it's not, but just imagine that's the amount of energy released. And to simulate a magnitude 9 earthquake, you've got to go from breaking one string of spaghetti to bringing over a million strings of spaghetti. But well, that hopefully helps to visualize that increase in energy as you go up the scale. Spaghetti and earthquake magnitude. Now, in terms of our two earthquakes that we're talking about, uh, they seem very similar in size. 
But actually now we know that actually they're very different in terms of the amount of energy released. The first earthquake was almost three times bigger than the second earthquake, even though the magnitude seemed quite similar because of that logarithmic effect. And that helps explain why most of the damage was caused by the first earthquake when unfortunately many people were in, or most people were in the houses asleep and then the second earthquake very much uh, impacted on the recovery process in the early hours after the earthquake. Okay, let's now move on and put those Turkish earthquakes into some sort of global picture. And what we've got here is an earthquake, uh, a, a map of, of, of uh, earthquakes recorded around the Earth over uh, a hundred year period. Um, and you'll see that we've got them characterized according to depth. That current shading relates to depth. So you only get a sense of that range of depths of earthquakes around the planet. And there are two main belts of seismotectonic activity on the planet. Earthquake activity, volcanic activity. The first one, as you're probably aware, surrounds the Pacific, the so-called Circum-Pacific Ring of Fire. That accounts for about 75% of all the earthquake energy, seismic energy that's released on the planet is in that tectonic environment. The second major belt that people tend to sort of often overlook is what's called the Alpine Himalayan Collision Zone, which extends from the sort of Azores over here, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, through the Mediterranean, over into the Middle East, across here into, uh, into China. That's called the Alpine Himalayan Collision Zone, and it accounts for around about 17, 17 to 20 percent of global seismic energy release. So those are the two main belts. And of course, our earthquake in Turkey is occurring here in the Alpine Himalayan Collision Zone. They are very different tectonic environments. And I'm sure you're all aware that that global distribution of earthquakes relates to plate tectonics and the fact that the Earth's crust is divided up into a number of major and minor plates that are moving relative to one another and stresses and strains accumulate along those boundaries and, and generate the seismicity of those uh, tectonic environments. We've been talking about those zones and in other parts of the world as well. Now, we talked about the Pacific and the Circum-Pacific. The tectonic environment there in the Pacific is largely a situation where you've got oceanic plate, oceanic crust, pushing down beneath the continental margins around the Pacific. So it's this sort of tectonic environment, what we call a subduction zone, where the oceanic plate pushes down beneath the continental crust, like along the coastline of South America, it generates earthquakes of a range of depths from shallow, intermediate, deep. It also, as the, magma, as, the, as the crust gets reworked, feeds the volcanic centers that we see in that part of the world. And also the biggest earthquakes in the Pacific also typically generate tsunami because of that sort of uh, oceanic context. So you get a sense of that here. You can see that you've got the range of depths in here reflecting the subduction around the Pacific Rim of that oceanic crust. Whereas our environment, the Alpine Himalayan Collision Zone, where the Turkish earthquakes occurred, is a very different sort of tectonic environment. You'll notice the seismicity is predominantly of shallow focal depth. And it's because what we've got here is continental crust colliding with continental crust. For example, the Indian subcontinent here pushing up into the Eurasian plate. So we don't have plate subduction, the dipping down of the plate beneath another. It's almost like sort of two buffaloes coming head to head. Uh, but what we do get in this continental, continental collision zone is the creation of some of the great foal mountains of the world, which are produced by that, uh, that collision of the continental masses. So if we look across the zone, you'll see we've got predominantly shallow earthquakes with the names on their names that will be familiar to you. Most of them, uh, not really much deep earthquake activity. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a different sort of tectonic environment to that which we see in the Pacific. Interestingly, the one part of this entire tectonic zone where you do get slightly deeper earthquakes is in the Mediterranean. Hence Vesuvius and, and the sorts of things I was supposed to be talking about last time. And the reason you've got uh, volcanicity here and deeper earthquakes is because as the African plate pushes north, there's some slithers of oceanic crust in here that are being pushed down beneath the southern margins of Europe 
and that gives us the volcanicity that we see in, uh, in places like uh, Italy and Greece. But predominantly shallow earthquakes, including where we saw our earthquake in Turkey, earthquakes in Turkey earlier this year. So that's the global pattern of seismicity. Hopefully puts our Turkish earthquakes into some sort of context. I said that most of the seismicity, most of the earthquake activity is in the Pacific. We've got about 17 to 20% here. You get a different sort of pattern if you start to look at the impact of earthquakes on people and where people are dying from earthquakes or being fatally uh, or being injured. A different sort of pattern emerges. And this is quite an interesting uh, slide, which sort of gives you some sense of that. It shows deaths from earthquakes, rather a gruesome topic, but deaths from earthquakes since 1900, so over 100 years. There are some big earthquakes in there. That's the Indian Ocean earthquake and tsunami of 2004. That's the Haiti earthquake of 2010. But what you see when you look at this global pattern of human suffering from earthquakes is that the Alpine Himalayan zone is disproportionately represented. As it says at the bottom there, it generates about 20% of the global seismicity, but it accounts for 75% of all the earthquakes that have killed more than 10,000 people in the last 100 years. So what is it about this part of the world that makes people, human societies, disproportionately susceptible to earthquakes. And that's a theme I'm going to sort of pick upon and explore because the Turkish earthquakes arguably are just another example of how uh, earthquakes in this part of the world very often cause horrific human losses. And why is that? What's going on? That's what I'm going to try and explore with you using those earthquakes. Notice also the size of the earthquakes. We talked about the Richter scale. Uh, a lot of the earthquakes in here, they're big, but they're not massive earthquakes, but they're causing, very often, terrible human suffering and loss. And of course, we've got an extra sort of one to put in there now because the earthquakes that occurred in, in February in Turkey were, were there. So that, again, it's just reinforcing that pattern that we see on that diagram. Uh, okay, so let's focus now on the Alpine Human Clay Collision Zone and look at some of the, the impacts of the last 30 years just to guess, reinforce that message of, I've just been saying and to put the Turkish earthquakes in context. So this is 30 years looking across the collision zone. Uh, so not just Turkey, but other parts of the zone. And you'll see that some of these deaths are, uh, death tolls are almost biblical in proportion. Um, but also look at the magnitude. Big earthquakes, but they're not massive earthquakes in global terms. And some of these losses, particularly look at the BAM earthquake, which you may remember from 2003, uh, really medium-sized event, killed more than 30,000 people. So I'm going to sort of try and explore that a little bit about not just the Turkey earthquakes, but what they tell us about human susceptibility across this region more generally. And I'm going to focus, obviously, on the 2023 earthquake uh, with the latest death toll around about 60,000 from those events. And I'm also going to refer back to an earlier earthquake, uh, 1999, the Izmit earthquake, excuse me, which occurred in uh, northwestern Turkey. Uh, 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 quite similar in size to the earthquakes we saw earlier uh, this year. And up until February, it was the most disastrous earthquake to have affected Turkey in the last uh, 30 years. So I'm going to look at those two events in particular and see what they tell us about human susceptibility to earthquakes, not just in Turkey, but across the broader uh, collision zone. But before we do that, I just want to just stop for a minute and just sort of sidestep and, and, and sort of think a little bit about what is an earthquake disaster? What's going on when we have an earthquake? And this is a model, it's a very simple model, but one that we developed in Chester way back in the early 90s. Um, and essentially, it reminds us that when we look at risk, whether it's earthquake risk or flood risk or any sort of risk, uh, but we're looking at when we look at earthquake risks, essentially, it's about the interface between a hazardous process, in our case, an earthquake, and a vulnerable population. So risk equals hazard times vulnerability. If we just separate those two out for a minute, what do we mean by vulnerable? Well, hopefully hazard, people understand that. We've been talking about earthquakes in the global distribution. 
Uh, what do we mean by vulnerability? Well, vulnerability essentially is susceptibility, susceptibility to loss. And we can measure it in different ways. We can talk about susceptibility to human loss from a hazard impact. We can talk about susceptibility to economic loss or insurance loss from a hazard impact. So using this model, I want you to imagine this is an earthquake. This is the area affected by an earthquake. This is maybe a town or a city or a village that's potentially susceptible to that earthquake. Now in that scenario, earthquake doesn't impact on the town or city. Let's imagine it's occurred in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. I get an alert, it comes through on my phone, earthquake, interesting. But it's, it's not creating any sort of risky situation. It's, 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 it's an interesting geophysical phenomenon, but it's not going to impact on people. Whereas here, the earthquake does impact on the population. And that's when we're looking at the situation of risk and when the risk becomes a reality, losses. And the magnitude of the losses in here or the magnitude of the risk will depend partly on that, the size of the earthquake, but also very much on that, the vulnerability of communities, of individuals, and how that's constructed. Now, when I was at university in the 1980s and we looked at risk, all we ever talked about was that. Managing earthquakes, controlling earthquakes, predicting earthquakes, building buildings to resist earthquakes. We didn't really talk about that. Um, but those two components. And I find it's quite a useful model because it reminds me you can take the same earthquake, the same physical process, and you can model it impacting on different communities around the world, and the same earthquake creates different risk scenarios. Not because the earthquake's changed, but because that's changed, people's vulnerability. And that's something which I think the Turkish earthquakes provide us quite a timely reminder of, as hopefully I'll be able to illustrate in the talk. So what's, let's now turn to the Turkish earthquakes. And uh, I'm going to begin <coughs> excuse me, by looking particularly at hazard. Let's look at the hazard, the context of the earthquakes in Turkey, before we then move on uh, to look at vulnerability. But I'll try and keep coming back to this model with reference to what happened in February. So in terms of hazard, this is the sort of, we looked at sort of tectonics at a global level. This is the tectonics now of the Middle East. And it's a great region from a tectonic perspective because it's got everything. It's got every sort of plate interaction you can, you can imagine. You've got the Red Sea here where new oceanic crust is being created. That's pushing plates apart. And that's pushing the Arabian plate in a sort of northeasterly direction. That's creating a continental collision zone and fall mountings here along the Iran-Iraq border. And it's sliding along the Dead Sea Fault System, which is a fascinating fault system that runs up through Jordan, uh, Israel, the West Bank, uh, Lebanon, Syria. Uh, and it's a strike-slip fault system, a bit like San Andreas, where one plate is able to move relative to another as it moves along there. And a lot of those earthquakes that have occurred there historically, I think things that feature in the Bible relate to seismicity along the Dead Sea fault system. So the Arabian plates move in that sort of direction. And one of the consequences of that, in terms of Turkey, is that this small sort of microplate or subplate here, the Anatolian plate, is being pushed out towards the west. And it's able to do that because of two more strike-slip fault systems, again, like the San Andreas, that enable this plate here to move over to the west. And the two key faults are the North Anatolian fault, which is in here, and the East Anatolian Fault, which is here, and it's the East Anatolian Fault that generated the earthquakes in February this year. So that's the, that's the tectonic setting of this part of the world. As I said, fascinating region. Uh, that's now zooming in on our two faults. You've got the North Anatolian Fault, uh, the East Anatolian Fault, the Dead Sea Fault system, and then the, the city of Istanbul on there. This is the Sea of Marmara. We'll be talking about that a little bit later in here, which is this area in here is, is amongst, uh, one of the most heavily urban, uh, urbanized and industrialized parts of Turkey. So you've got a major fault system through there. And then this is the East Anatolian Fault uh, 
which generated the earthquake in February. Now, the North Anatolian Fault is, is a fascinating fault from a seismicity perspective because it, it behaves in a particular way. And we've known about this for some time. It's, it's, it's quite unusual in this respect. Uh, but back in the 1980s, seismologists noted when they looked at the history of earthquakes along the North Anatolian Fault, including in the 20th century, they noticed there seemed to be some sense of the earthquakes migrating along the fault. Almost as though it was unzipping. As each bit failed, it passed the stress on to the next bit, and then that failed, and so on. And in 19, early 1980, uh, seismologists predicted, in inverted commas, that the next big earthquake on the North Anatolian Fault would be in here, which was a concern because it's quite close to Istanbul, it's around the Sea of Marmara, and as I said, it's one of uh, Turkey's most heavily industrialized zones. So they made that sort of prediction back in the early 1980s. That's not to say they gave us an exact date, but they said that's where the next big earthquake on the North Anatolian Fault is most likely to occur. And then bang, 1999, the Izmit earthquake occurred there. Magnitude 7.4. And in a minute we'll watch a clip. What emerges when you watch that clip is just how poorly prepared the Turkish authorities were for this earthquake. Particularly given the seismologists have said that's the place that's most likely to rupture next. So what we'll do now is just watch, hopefully, uh, a short news clip from 1999 where we get a sense of what happened in that earthquake um, and, uh, and then sort of extrapolate from that. Let's just hope we can get YouTube to work. Now, this is obviously news reporting. Some of the scene that, uh, if you're particularly sensitive, so the, the, the pictures of body bags, and I just just warn you. Uh, but, uh, so this is from 1999. Crumbled homes, muddy streets, and an odor of death below. It's the aftermath of the worst earthquake in Turkish history. Searchers keep sifting, but hope of survival has passed. We are very sorry. Uh, uh, all of our family and friends are dead. This is downtown Golcik. Twisted metal and concrete are everywhere. When this apartment building collapsed that I'm in front of, the people inside were trapped. Their bodies have yet to be recovered. Oil-covered rocks line the Sea of Marmara. Thousands died here. Some buildings even toppled into the sea. Their water system is completely down, and they're actually taking water right now from uh, a river, from a lake, and they're drinking raw lake water. We saw a lot of land problems, breathing problems, because people was exposed to the rain. Not only are survivors exposed to the elements. But very few had insurance. Most will have no legal recourse to sue builders accused of cutting corners and shoddy work. Same builders make five buildings. All of them are collapsed. He's a murderer. He is a murderer. Legal accountability is just one step. Survivors must secure permanent shelter, find a steady food supply, overcome disease, and rebuild the infrastructure of entire cities. So that was 1999. Um, and the government at the time, Erdogan's government, came in for, for quite a lot of criticism. Um, uh, partly because of uh, 
the building standards um, that, uh, that were, were, were clearly inadequate, um, but particularly about the lack of preparation, the fact that it took them so long uh, in, after that earthquake to get heavy lifting gear into the area affected, and so on and so forth. So it came in for a lot of criticism because there had been this, this warning from the seismologists that, that that was where the earthquake was most likely to occur, or that part of Turkey, and they seemed to be woefully underprepared. So in the aftermath of that earthquake, the, the, the authorities promised to do better. Uh, Turkey introduced stricter building codes. It's now got some of the strictest building codes in the world. Um, and they also introduced uh, uh, a tax, an earthquake tax, a national tax. And the aim of that tax was to raise funds, essentially to enable earthquake preparedness going forward beyond 1999. And up until uh, the end of last year, that earthquake tax that was introduced in 1999 is estimated to have raised about 3 billion US dollars uh, for the Turkish government. So that was 1999. Um, that was the North Anatolian Fault. As I said, the earthquakes in February didn't occur on the North Anatolian Fault. They occurred here on the East Anatolian Fault. Uh, and the question again then arises, well, could they have been anticipated? Um, and that's something that's, that's quite an interesting question. This is, a, this is a map. It shows earthquakes in Turkey in the 20th century, magnitude greater than six. Um, and it shows the pattern of seismicity throughout the 20th century in Turkey. Anybody notice anything interesting? It's all in the north. Where aren't there any earthquakes or any big ones? On the East Anatolian Fault. Yeah, the East Anatolian Fault. Now, if the North Anatolian Fault's moving, that's got to move at some point. So, yeah, that, that sort of distribution of earthquakes in Turkey again started to raise alarm bells. And uh, again, seismologists drew this to the attention of the authorities and went as far as to predict that uh, the next significant earthquake in Turkey would occur on the East Anatolian Fault. In the, I think they even went as far as to say that it was most likely to be the largest earthquake in Turkey this century. Uh, in this area here, that's where they predicted the earthquake would occur. And then bang. February this year, that's exactly where the earthquakes happened. Now those are the two ruptures, the East Anatolian Fault and uh, an offshoot of that. This section of the fault last ruptured, I think, 1893. So, again, history shows us it can generate big earthquakes. Uh, it was unusually quiet in the 20th century. That wasn't going to continue indefinitely. Now, again, what we're not getting here is a specific prediction. But what we are getting is a good sense of where earthquakes are more or less likely to occur. And given the fact that when you put a building up, you generally put a building up for, what, 50 years, 75 years, life expectancy of a building, it's quite reasonable to expect, on the basis of those projections, that earthquakes are going to occur in areas, or you can use those projections to identify areas where earthquakes are likely to occur if you're planning to put a building up uh, in them. So let's move to those earthquakes now. And uh, these are, this is a different sort of form of measure of earthquakes. This is really measuring earthquake impact. It's what we call intensity. So every earthquake has a single magnitude measurement. That's the amount of energy released. But every earthquake has lots of intensity measurements. And those essentially provide a sense of the, uh, the severity of the shaking around in the earthquake epicenter and around the earthquake epicenter. And it can be everything from, you know, I found it difficult to walk to my whole building collapsed. But essentially, these are maps that show the distribution of the shaking from the two earthquakes in Turkey in February. The larger one over here on the left-hand side, where you can see the severity of shaking extending along the fault, but then gradually dissipating as you move away, but with some significant shaking here in northern Syria. And then the second earthquake uh, slightly uh, uh, more localized shaking because of its smaller magnitude. Interestingly, sometimes the shaking dies off and then you get a secondary peak of shaking. That can be for a whole range of factors. It might be because of building standards, it could be because of the subsoil, uh, because subsoil very much influences how severe the shaking is in one area compared to 
another. And the earthquakes, again, led to all sorts of questions. And the inevitable question was, why did so many buildings collapse? That was the first question. Why were so many buildings so badly built, uh, including public buildings, hospitals, schools, and so on and so forth? So that was the first question that was fired at the government. Uh, particularly many modern buildings, reinforced concrete structures. It was a big earthquake, but too many modern reinforced concrete structures experienced failures like that. As I said, bear in mind, Turkey has got some of the most stringent building regulations in the world. It is possible to put up buildings that will resist earthquakes. This is an example from the earthquake. You've got the fault line is running through here. You can see the displacement in the road. So the fault is going through there. This building's very close to the fault. It's obviously taken quite a hit, but it's resisted the earthquake. Presumably that building was put up in accordance with the building codes, whereas those buildings or that building was not. So lots of questions about building standards and what's gone wrong in Turkey. Why haven't the lessons of 1999 been learned? And then the second area of criticism of the government was again about preparedness. There were too many scenes like this and the poor emergency response, uh, particularly given what we've seen uh, about the seismic gap and the fact that seismologists had said that uh, this part of Turkey is likely to experience a major earthquake this century. So again, some quotes from that time uh, which give you a sense of just how poorly prepared the government was uh, for the earthquake. What was President's response? Well, the President said it's impossible to prepare for disasters this big. That was Erdogan. Uh, I think he later sort of retracted that comment, but that was his initial response. Seemingly trying overlooking the fact that arguably the disaster was so big because they didn't prepare and had his government prepared better, then the disaster wouldn't have been so big. Um, he also went on uh, to argue that you know, those sorts of things have always happened in Turkey. It's part of destiny's plan, uh, that sense of it's God's will. There's nothing we can do about these things. Again, that's something that Erdogan said in the days following the earthquake. And then you've got the response there from the opposition MP questioning that. And what you, that response from President Erdogan, we've seen so often from political leaders when you get these sorts of things happen. They try to blame the environment. They blame the earthquake. It's natural. It's nothing we can do about these things. It's natural. They try to divert attention away from that. Things that are within their control to do something about. And again, when I was at university, we talked a lot about natural disasters and focused on that. And the shift in disaster risk work in the last 20 has been very much towards away from earthquakes. We can't do anything about earthquakes. Earthquakes have always happened. They'll always happen. But we can do a lot about that. And uh, that's, that's, that's been the shift in focus in this side of sort of work in the time I've worked in it. In fact, some people would even go as far as to say there's no such thing as a natural earthquake disaster. Because an earthquake doesn't pose any threat whatsoever to healthy human beings who are out in the open. The only reason people die in earthquakes is because buildings fall on them or bits of buildings fall on them. Who puts the buildings up? People do. So how is it a natural disaster? It's a completely people-constructed disaster. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's... But Erdogan, trying to focus away from that and say, you know, it's all about the environment, it's all about the earthquake, it's God's will, there's nothing much we can do about it. And people, rightly so, pushing back against that and questioning that sort of perspective. So, uh, I guess bringing things sort of towards a sort of close, in terms of uh, how this sort of fits into the bigger international disaster risk reduction agenda, as I said, uh, the UN has been working in the last 30 years to try to bring about meaningful international cooperation to reduce the likelihood of these sorts of things particularly in the global south. And again, if you go back to the 1990s and the UN agenda, it was very much focused on this, predicting earthquakes, controlling floods, engineering science and all that sort of thing, trying to control the environment. 
Whereas now the UN agenda has switched very much to that and trying to do things about vulnerability. And if we look at uh, the latest agenda from the UN, which is what's called the Sendai framework, it's due to run to 2030. If you look at the priorities in disaster risk reduction today from the United Nations, uh, those are the two priorities, and, and particularly this focus on governance. Um, and key aspects of governance, the action and manner of organizing a state. Key aspects of government that really don't seem to have been on show in the case of Turkey, certainly the experience of the last two major earthquakes. Particularly the sense of accountability of politicians, of leaders, um, equity and inclusiveness, um, women far more likely to die in earthquakes. If you look at the data globally, women are far more likely to die in earthquakes than men. So if you want to address earthquake disaster risk, you have to involve women because women are far more susceptible to earthquakes and more likely to die than men. One of the most, just to silence, one of the most arresting statistics I ever read about the Indian Ocean tsunami, you remember that tsunami that killed a quarter of a million people, is in some of the communities worst affected by the Indian Ocean tsunami, 75% of everybody that died was female. And there's a whole range of reasons why that's the case, but yeah, if you want sustainable disaster risk reduction, it's got to include issues to do with gender, culture, religion, and so on and so forth. Um, participation, rule of law, again, all these things that didn't seem to be working as they should in Turkey prior to the earthquake, and also probably link into uh, some of the challenges that we experience across the, the broader Alpine Himalayan collision zone and help to explain why we have these disasters in Pakistan, in India, in Iran, and so on. It's all part of governance and the challenges there. So, following the earthquake, uh, the government did attempt to, <laughs> to give a sense of sort of governance. Uh, so, uh, lots of people arrested after the earthquake. Um, and uh, the government in Turkey made a big thing about that. Um, although, of course, who's not been arrested is the building inspectors, the local officials that allowed the contractor to build the building that fell down. And there were even uh, reports that in large parts of the area that were worst affected by the earthquake, the builders had actually been granted amnesties. So they'd been told, ignore the building regulations, just to try to encourage development in that part of Turkey, which was under a lot of population pressure from migration and refugees. So there'd been a lot of uh, almost sanctioned illegal construction taking place, encouraged by the government that had granted amnesties, apparently, to, uh, to builders and contractors to encourage them to develop in the area. And then, of course, aftershocks for the president. Uh, I actually, when I wrote this talk, uh, I didn't know what the other, we, we didn't know what the outcome was going to be. The lecture we now know. Um, and he, he scraped in, he managed to scrape in for another term of office. It was a close run thing. Uh, and if you look where he did particularly badly in the election, perhaps not surprisingly, down here in southeastern Turkey, in the areas affected by the earthquake, he did badly. Also in the major urban areas and the cities where you tend to have a younger population, perhaps maybe a better educated population and a greater proportion of the electorate that take a more secular view of things than perhaps some of the more rural areas uh, away from the major cities. So a close run thing, but Erdogan is back in uh, an office um, for another term. So to go to my sort of, uh, back to my question that I started with, a uh, sort of rhetorical question, is it history repeating itself? Well, I would argue it is. If you go back to the two circles of my diagram, it's history repeating itself in terms of the earthquake, because these earthquakes have occurred in that part of Turkey before, uh, and it's done it again. Shouldn't be any surprise there. Uh, that's history repeating itself. But it also, I think, is a case of history repeating itself in terms of the woefully inadequate government response to preparing for the earthquake and then to, uh, to responding once the earthquake has occurred. So history repeating itself I'd argue on, on two counts in terms of the earthquake and 
in terms of the government's preparation and then response after it. What about the future? Well, again, we talked about the North Anatolian Fault, and some of you are probably aware. Uh, we talked about the migration of seismicity along this fault, and the 1999 earthquake occurred there. We know this section of the fault here has generated big earthquakes in the past. We know they've impacted on Istanbul in the past and caused significant losses. So the big concern in Turkey now, probably, the biggest concern is about this section of the North Anatolian Fault and the potential of that to generate a major earthquake, maybe even a tsunami as well, because it's likely to be beneath the Sea of Marmara, and the implications of that for Istanbul, where there are a lot of concerns about the vulnerability of the building stock and some of the development that's taken place there very rapidly over the last 20 or 30 years. So my fear is that, yeah, history could actually repeat itself again uh, in the not-too-distant future. Um, and, uh, um, yes, hopefully not back talking about that. So, thank you. Thank you for your... So happy to take any questions you might have. Okay, uh, any questions? But I have one first. <laughs> it's the advantage of being the woman with the microphone. 75% uh, of women, there are a whole host of reasons. You can't dangle one like that, come on. Well, can you give me some reason why, why if, you, if you're a coastal community affected by the Indian Ocean tsunami, why are women more likely to die in the tsunami than, not women, women, adult women and girls, why are they more likely to die in, in the tsunami than, than boys and men? What would, sorry? So they're more likely to be in the home. Okay, that's good. So that's why women are more likely to die in earthquakes because they're not. They're more likely to be in the home when we, you know, buildings collapse. Okay, that's one reason. Another reason? Absolutely the dress. A lot of the communities, women wore traditional dress. Um, and a tsunami isn't just water, it's full of garbage and, you know, cars and bits of tree and, and shopping trolleys. And the women's attire dragged them down and got caught in the, in the water. Uh, and, of course, the women were likely to be modest and less willing or even able uh, to take clothes off, whereas, you know, uh, perhaps the boys and the men would, would feel less uh, reticence in that regard. Uh, good. And there's a... Possibly. Possibly not as strong. Yep. More women than there are men. Sorry? More women than what there are men. Yep, possibly. There's something else that women can't do, or many of them do, the men and the boys. They can't swim. It's as simple as that. Why do you need... You don't need to, to well, why do girls need to swim? The boys need to swim, because they're going to help on the boats and blah, blah, blah. So, absolutely. We don't need to, you know, so a simple act like the girls are not expected or needed or required to swim had a big impact. Um, and then the other, the other thing that particularly impacts on women in earthquakes is they tend to be the carers. So they're more likely to have uh, children in the home. So they get delayed in their evacuation, trying to help children, looking after elderly parents. All these things help to explain why women are more likely to die in earthquakes and died in the tsunami. OK, we have a question here. So just to finish that off, so a lot of the stuff that the, the, the UN now does in disaster actually starts with women in villages and gets them into groups and, and, and uh, yeah, keep... Yeah. Um, I went to Christchurch and was surprised to see a lot of really low-level buildings with tin roofs and um, a lot of warnings about what to do if there were an earthquake. And I wonder how the Christchurch... Um, earthquake compares with what happened in Turkey and whether similar things like were there a similar amount of women killed or um, were, were their precautions much better being more developed? 
This is Christchurch, New Zealand, yeah? And, and these, are, these are buildings that survived the earthquake or after the earthquake? This is after the earthquake. So they, they weren't built? But it, they knew earthquakes were coming, so a lot of the buildings are low level. Yep. And they have, um, they have uh, corrugated roofs. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, the, 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 yeah, there's a lot that can be done you know, quite cheaply and quite cost-effectively to, to make people less susceptible to earthquakes. And in places like New Zealand, that sort of stuff is done. People are made aware. Uh, awareness is raised in places like Turkey. It doesn't happen. Um, another good example, I mean, talk, you're talking about roofs and, and corrugated roofs. Uh, if you look at South America... There have been some horrific earthquake disasters in South America. And one of the big killers in South America is actually the tile, the clay tile on the roofs. Uh, and essentially what happens is uh, people sort of, the earthquake comes and, uh, and tiles fall off the roofs and they kill people either in the house or running out into the street. Now, the tile wasn't, it was something that was introduced into South America by the Spanish. If you look at what the indigenous people in South America did, the Incas, the Aztecs, they didn't use tiles. They developed ways of building uh, structures that would resist earthquakes. But the Spanish and the Portuguese arrived and said, no, we don't build buildings like that. We, we build buildings like this with nice pink tiles and balconies and that, uh, and narrow streets, because that's how we build things in Spain. And it's, it's, it's been... That sort of way of doing things and building in, in South America has been responsible for some awful earthquake catastrophes. And so what they've been doing there is trying to go to undo all that and go back to encouraging people to build buildings that have got corrugated roofs and things like that. So, yeah, it can be done. Uh, and very often it's, 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 it's low tech. It's not necessarily high tech. But it involves involving people, really, in the process. Here we go. One more. Is um, the situation in Japan due to its relative wealth? Because Japanese buildings, I mean, my. Sorry? Oh, right. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I won't hold it too close. Um, yes, in Japan, I mean, they've, you know, they've got these huge, tall skyscraper buildings, but. Is, is the fact that they don't tend to collapse due to the wealth and the, const and the, and the way they construct them. Very much so. Tokyo, you know, I know my husband talked about being in Tokyo and you know, being on the 24th floor of a hotel and the building shaking, but it never fell down. Yeah, very much. I mean, obviously, Japan is a very wealthy country, so two sides, really. They, they do have quite a sophisticated earthquake warning system in Japan which is designed to provide a warning. Again, people often get earthquake warnings misunderstand. An earthquake warning isn't going to stop the building falling down. The idea of the earthquake warning is to allow people to get out uh, or to take shelter. Uh, but if the building's badly put up, it's still going to fall down, whether you give people a warning or not. Um, but Japan's got that sort of... T it's got both the warnings and then it has these national uh, preparedness days where they rehearse what to do when the warning goes particularly in the schools, um, just like we rehearse uh, fire alarm drills. Uh, but they've also got the money to spend on the infrastructure. And, um, and it also comes back to the will, because Turkey's not a particularly poor country. Uh, it does have building codes, but a building code is only as good as the will to enforce it. And if the government's not enforcing the building code and not putting in place the governance then the code just is, is, becomes meaningless, whereas Japan has been very effective in both developing the warning systems and developing the building codes and then enforcing the building codes. Um, I, have, I have a friend in Tokyo, and their properties are built new and then demolished after 70 years and rebuilt because of the building codes. And, and therefore, if you buy a new house in Japan, the value goes down and down and down. Do you think? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Totally the it astonished me. It was totally the opposite. Yeah. 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 Any more questions? Yes, Janet. 
Uh, you remind me that I believe when we were in Istanbul, we were told that, I think it was the Blue Mosque was actually built to be earthquake resistant and had actually suffered earthquakes and survived. So clearly there are traditions in mm. Turkey which do enable them to build earthquake proof building. Yeah, it, it, the, there are these traditions and they exist across the Middle East. Um, so these traditions, and I mentioned in, in South America, nobody taught the Aztecs or the Incas how to build earthquake proof structures, but there's no doubt they were aware of earthquakes and earthquake forces and they developed ways of building you know, grand stone structures, but also rural uh, dwellings that would resist earthquakes. This they, just developed within the society, maybe over a number of generations. Um, and it's the same you know, with, with some of the big stone structures that you see in the Middle East. You know, the, 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 the architects knew about seismic forces and how to, uh, how to put up structures that would resist. It's not just the big structure. If you go to Pakistan, um, the earthquake which um, occurred in 2000, I forget the exact date, but uh, there are some, there's, a, there's, a, there's a traditional way of building with um, adobe, with mud brick in Pakistan. Um, and again, in some of the, tra the, the communities, people developed a way of building with mud brick with a lattice, uh, a wood lattice within the structure that gives the building the resistance to shearing forces. Nobody told them to do it, it just, it just became ingrained in, in the way of doing things. But all too often those cultures either don't exist or they've just got lost, particularly as people have moved to using new building materials like concrete and steel and, and don't really know how to work with them um, and choose to ignore the building codes which tell them how to work with them and, and how to use those materials. But yes, there's lots of evidence of, of the people in previous centuries have, have responded more effectively sometimes than governments seem able to do today in terms of building earthquake resistant structures. Martin, that was absolutely wonderful. I, I thought that was a very thoughtful presentation and I, I'm sure we all learned a thank lot. You. So uh, I want to thank, thank you. you. And as a final comment, I just wonder what governments anywhere, including here, are well prepared for predictable disasters. Because mm. um, earthquakes aren't the only disasters no, no, that no, can no. hit us, and no. I'm, I'm not confident yep. that any government is terribly well prepared for pandemics, earthquakes, COVID, fires, <laughs> or whatever. So a salutary lesson for all of us, not just relevant to Turkey. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.